But you know, she was brought up in the public school system, so we can't really blame her, can we? And then, so I had to call her and tell her, I said, you don't know what the militia is and you need to do a retraction in your class because that was an absolute lie. And I really resent the fact that you're trying to teach my son lies about the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment was not there. You really think the Founding Fathers got together in Philadelphia to devise a document of freedom to protect fundamental rights of the citizens, to prevent a recurrence of the abuse and tyranny of King George III? That was the reason they got together in the first place. That's the reason they fought and gave their lives and risked everything for the holy cause of liberty, as Patrick Henry called it. And you think they sat down there in the heat and humidity of uh, Philadelphia and said, right after they guaranteed the First Amendment right to freedom of speech and freedom of religion and the right to peaceably assemble and freedom of the press and the right to file grievances that they said, oh, time out, we ought to guarantee the right of our soldiers to keep and bear arms. How abs absurd, how redundant, how ridiculous. These rights weren't guaranteed to army personnel or any other member of government when you know and understand that the entire purpose of the Bill of Rights was to be the beacon of all laws, the 10 fundamental laws that government could never violate, could never touch, could never even talk about changing, altering, or encroaching upon. That's the Bill of Rights. And this was the second one so that we could guarantee all the others. And so I had to take that time to teach the government teacher and said, don't ever teach my son lies about our country or our constitution again. And we'll just leave it at that. And now folks, we have our schools doing this full time. So is it any wonder we keep raising a generation of globalist socialists when charter schools and home schools are doing a much better job of teaching the truth and, and what's really going on. Now, one of my favorite quotes probably in this book is from Alan Keyes. And uh, he said, uh, and I heard him say this in person, he said that, quote, the only difference between today's slavery and the slavery of the Old South is that at least the plantation owners paid for the chains. <laughs> Folks, we have got to have governors and state legislators who know and understand that the people of this state and of this country have got to stop paying for the change. When we stop paying for the change and paying for our own destruction, we're gonna make, we're gonna go 90% more towards freedom. The other 10% is right here in our counties. We've got to have the support of that 90% from our sheriffs and local officials. If you have your county commission and your county attorney and your sheriff, what is that, five, six, seven people? You only have to deal with five or six, seven people. Or would you rather deal with 534, because I'm not counting Ron Paul, 534 corrupt individuals in Washington, D.C., who have already proven to us over and over and over they do not care about your constitution or about your freedom or about your state or about your children as long as they own all of that they don't care what do your politicians care about they care about being re-elected that is it so let's stop playing their game and and let me make this perfectly clear again do not worry about what Washington, D.C. politicians are going to be asking you to do or asking for money or blah, blah, blah. Don't waste your time and money on stuff like that. If you think that there's an answer in Washington, D.C. for the principles of freedom, then I've got beachfront property for you in Omaha. <laughs> it simply is not going to happen. How many times do we have to get hit over the head with the baseball bat of Washington, D.C. corruption before we get it? I've got it. I am not going to mess. When people call me and say, sign this petition to your congressman or, or send this email to your congressman or to your senator or whatnot, 
I just kind of smile and I go on with the real work that we need to be doing, concentrating at the local and county level. This is where we make it happen. If you have a governor and a sheriff who know and understand their responsibilities to stand and uphold the United States Constitution, you win. And that's two people. Okay? We would love to have the county commissioners, one or two, and the county attorney. Because if you have the county attorney on board, I pray for the day when a sheriff will stand and say, IRS agent, you're under arrest and the county attorney's gonna prosecute you. you know? Okay, so why did a small town sheriff file a lawsuit against the Clinton administration, take it all the way to the Supreme Court, risk everything, take all this heat, and win a case at the United States Supreme Court, a monumental case. Why would a sheriff do that? Isn't his job just to chase drug runners and, and family fights and drunk drivers and run roadblocks and, and write tickets? And heck, we don't have to write tickets now. Cameras do that for us. We got them all over Arizona. We got big brother government like you wouldn't believe. We got cameras doing that for you, you know? So isn't that what your sheriff's supposed to do? Then we turn to something I finally discovered in our foundational documents. What is the purpose of government? Why do you have a governor? Why do you have a sheriff? Why do you have a state legislature? Why do you have a governor? Why do you have a president? Uh, well, God only knows why we have him, but anyway. But from, but from your dog catcher all the way down to the president. Why do we have them? And then I finally found the answer. And, and we've all heard this stuff before. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. We have to take that. We have to believe in this. It has to be part of what we actually are doing here. Okay? And then it says that our Creator endowed us with certain unalienable rights. Unalienable. It's not inalienable. It's unalienable. You can't lean them. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The next line is the kicker. It's the reason we have our sheriffs. It's the reason we have our government. It's the reason we have officials. And you know what it says? Quote, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. To secure these rights. If your sheriff, if your governor, if your legislators, are not securing these rights of what? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness or property. If they're not securing those rights, then they're not doing their jobs. And it really all boils down to that. So, the reason that this small town sheriff was the first one in the United States, and perhaps in the United States history, to file a case against my own federal government was because I was trying to keep my word to secure these rights. And after the meeting that we had in, in Phoenix with all the sheriffs in, in Arizona, three agents of the BATF showed up at our meeting. Three of them. There's only 15 counties in Arizona. It doesn't take three agents to come to a meeting, you know, with only 13, 14 sheriffs. And they gave us a document. I still have the document. It's back on my table. I still have the document. It's a 25-page document. And they said, Sheriffs, these are your marching orders. This is what you will do. These are your regulations in complying with the Brady Bill. Well, as you remember, the propaganda behind the Brady Bill was that it was a five-day waiting period. And Bill Clinton was promising all of us a utopia in America. If we could get this passed, then our streets will be safer. Parents won't have to worry about their kids going to the park by themselves. Police will be protected. There won't be any more shootings in the streets. No more drive-bys. Cops won't even have to wear guns. 